thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, you know, over the last 20 years or so, uh, I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at organizations and leaders that do the wrong thing. Uh, people that make mistakes, uh, leaders that maybe go in the wrong direction. Um, and I wrote this book, Why Smart Executives Fail, and a bunch of other uh, books like that. Work with a bunch of companies on those, uh, uh, on those ideas. And there's really two themes that, that kind of jump out, out of all, all that work. Number one, of course, is it's always about people. It's always about individual leaders that decide to change or not to change. And then the, the, the second thing is really about, uh, about learning. Uh, and it's really remarkable how often I found it the case that very successful people found it very difficult to actually adapt and change to new circumstances. And, and learning requires you not just to do new things, but to unlearn some of, the, uh, some of the old things. And so I thought I would share three lessons that come out of that work that kind of build on those two themes about leadership and people on the one hand and, uh, and learning, uh, learning on the other hand. Um, here's uh, something that will soon become an, an artifact for uh, many of us. Um, uh, and the reason is, of course, that we have uh, this, uh, this gadget, right? Uh, industry after industry has been transformed. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's not just technology, it's certainly your own industry in retail and fashion. And we heard a lot about the internet, we heard a lot about the digital revolution, uh, and that's part and parcel of what everyone in this room is, uh, is dealing with. But, you know, it goes wider than that as well, because, you know, how do we used to watch uh, television? You know, these little TV screens, black and white, but today we have a whole different story. We, uh, well, we've got, uh, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and uh, um, Apple TV and Roku and, and you name it. You know, it, it's not, uh, it's not uh, our father's Oldsmobile, it's not our father's TV anymore. It's actually not even a TV. It's an iPad or it's a laptop. The entire generation of millennials, including my daughter, do not use television hardly at all. They are using, they are collecting and, and processing information and data through, uh, through laptops and iPads, and, uh, and that's a big transformation, that's a gigantic transformation. Um, it goes further, uh, how'd you get here today? One of these guys, perhaps, if you weren't within walking distance uh, or staying in the hotel. Uh, but even the good old taxi cab industry has been transformed because we have something called Uber. Any Uber fans out there? Uh, oh my God, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, and you know, you just kind of tap on your, uh, on your iPhone or, or you know, your, your Galaxy or whatever you have, and it tells you, look, we're coming, and this is how long it's gonna take, and it's a nice kind of cool car that comes, and you know who the, uh, and you've, you've prepaid for it already, it's very smooth and it's easy, and uh, the reaction from people out there is, wow, this is just uh, the future of city travel. I mean, industry after industry is being transformed. And the thing that you see in common across so many of these companies is the incumbents, the established companies are the ones that are aware, are watching, but are watching it go by. Uh, there's a lot of other examples. Uh, Best Buy, what happened to Circuit City not that long ago and Best Buy na now is still struggling. We heard a lot about JCPenney and the incredible turnaround challenge that Mr. Allman is working on right now. Uh, Blockbuster is, is old news to be, uh, to be sure and Kodak and, uh, and, and others. I guess the point is, uh, it, it really is happening, this transformation is really happening in industry after industry, which brings me to, to lesson number one, which is, well, yeah, you know, it could happen to you. Um, it could happen to anyone. Um, and, and, and the reason why I, I hear, I find uh, people gonna hear, my, hear me talk about these stories, and you know, you know a lot of these stories yourself, from the, from the Kodaks to the Best Buys and the, and the others, uh, but so many people say, that doesn't apply to me, and you know why? Because we're different. And okay, you might be different, but uh, I've got, uh, uh, actually we have business history and lots and lots of books and other work that I've done and others have done as well that indicate being different is no defense. In fact, I'd hate to say, you know, my strategy for dealing with transformation going on around me is I'm different. Uh, that is a losing formula. And it's a, uh, and it requires, you know, it requires humility. It requires open-mindedness. It requires adaptability. These are, these are tough things to do, especially when you've been so successful in the past, which is going to account for everyone in this room. And so it really becomes a, 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 a challenge. So uh, let me give you another type, of, uh, another type of story. How about the, the greatest bicycle company ever? You remember Schwinn, Schwinn Bicycle Company? How, how many of you ha had a Schwinn growing up? Mm, fantastic. In those old surveys of America's greatest brand names, number one and number two were Marlboro and Coca-Cola, it's kind of interesting. Number three was Schwinn, that's the point. In fact, people used to joke, if your parents really loved you, you'd get a Schwinn. 
And if they didn't, you might get a huffy, uh, <laughs> which is something I'm still dealing with. But in any event, um, <laughs> um, what happened to the Schwinn Bicycle Company? Well, if you're into biking, cycling, you might know some of, you might know some of this story. Um, there's a guy named Gary, uh, Gary Fisher uh, who lived in Northern California, and he would go down hills on his bicycle with his friends, basically all day long. That's kind of what he did, uh, the beginning of mountain biking, right? And so one day he's kind of walking down the street, and I will show you what he was doing. He was walking down the street, and he comes across a Schwinn bicycle frame that somebody had tossed out, still solid bicycle frame. And, uh, and by the way, this is a true story as opposed to the other stories I'm telling you today. Um, and he puts oversized tires onto the bicycle. I don't know where he got that creative spark. He put oversized tires on the bike, solid frame, going down hills with his friends, falling much less often because it's a more stable bike. And so his friends see him and they say, Gary, where'd you get the bike? And he says, I made it. And the next question is, and this is how maybe all entrepreneurs start at some level, could you make one for me? And he says, you know, he's thinking to himself, well, I go down hills all day long on my bike. I got a bit of spare time. Why not? I'll make one. And he makes one, and he makes five, and he makes ten. He's making hundreds. And somehow, uh, Schwinn managers discover Gary Fisher in the very earliest days. So it's kind of interesting to think about. It's not that they didn't know about it. Uh, and they fly out to Northern California, three senior Schwinn managers in their suits and their ties, looking real sharp. And they see Gary. And here's Gary with long, long hair smoking, God knows why, uh, bombing down hills all day long with his friends. What do you think the reaction was of the senior Schwinn managers when they saw Gary Fisher? Forget about it, right? Who is this guy? Uh, he'll never amount to anything, which, by the way, some of you may know, the first time that British Airways executives met Richard Branson, they said the same thing. You know, you never want to judge a book by its cover, except for my own books, but in any event. Uh, is it a mistake? Is it a mistake not to jump into the mountain biking business as soon as you hear about it? Could be a fad, you can't be sure. So, you know, we're not going to criticize them for not jumping in right away. But you know what? One year goes by, two years, three years, four years. Major Schwinn competitors are now in the mountain biking business. Five, six years, seven years after Schwinn managers first discover Gary Fisher, they introduced the first Schwinn mountain bike. Seven years later, I mean, talk about response to competitive threat. You're going by seasons uh, and, and by weeks sometimes, uh, and, uh, and, you see what, uh, and you see what happened. And so, you know, so what, what, what's the net net of all that? Well, you know, in, in 1992, um, after, you know, almost a century of family ownership, Schwinn Bicycle Company files for bankruptcy. Um, after huge successes, tremendous successes over a long period of time, and, um, and the reality is, you know, a lot of things happen. It's not just kind of the Gary Fisher story. It's a lot of other things. You know, they outsourced a lot of the production to Taiwan and to China and gave away the technology in the process. Obviously not a particularly clever move uh, and, and a few other things. But it gives you really a, uh, a, a sense of the price that you pay. And by the way, if you see the Schwinn brand today, some of you are maybe are doing spinning or, or have sh a Schwinn bike. You see it today. It has nothing to do with the company. A group of investors acquired all of the trademarks, all of the, um, the assets out of bankruptcy court and have resurrected the Schwinn brand because it's such a fabulous brand. Uh, and you know, most people th today who have a Schwinn might have some memory of a, of a great brand from the past, but has nothing to do with the people that built it and ran it and, and successfully uh, built it uh, over, all, all, over almost a century. So you know, what's, uh, what's the lesson here? Uh, to me, the lesson is, uh, is really, you know, it's about all of us, right? It's not that people are, are unable to change, it's, it's that they're unwilling to change. And those two words are really important. You know, un unable means, you know, you, you can't do it. You don't know what to do. You can't figure it out. Unwilling means you kind of know some, some of what's going on around you. You know how big digital is. You know about the changes that are going on in different industries, in, in different countries. Uh, but we're, we, we think we're okay for now. We don't have to respond that, uh, that quickly, or, we, uh, or it might not apply to us, or, or, or some such, uh, some such uh, mindset. And this is uh, actually very difficult, because if you really want to change in this way, you, you have to do some unlearning. Some of the stuff that got you to the winner circle, if left unchanged, will also lead to your eventual downfall. I mean, that's absolutely the case. Maybe many of you have seen that along the way with colleagues, maybe as you thought about your own development over the courses, course of your own career, how you've had to extend and expand, learn more, acquire different, uh, different skill sets, and, and actually undo some of, what, uh, some of what you did. 
and, and it's, uh, it's been fascinating this morning to, uh, to be watching because you, know, you have someone from, you have the founder of, uh, of Nasty Gal who grew up with social media. It's in her DNA, it's in the DNA of that company. They don't have to unlearn that. But for most of the people in this room, you have to unlearn a lot of things. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, Eric this morning said something similar, how you, you know, uh, the, the transformation of, of social media and the way in which millennials are, are shopping and thinking about, uh, thinking about retail, thinking about fashion, th that's different. It's not the same. And you have to make sure that you do everything you can to recognize, you know what, 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 what I was doing up to this point, okay, some of it is still great, some we're going to continue, but we gotta, we got to switch some things up. Takes, takes a bit of courage, I think, to do that also. Takes a bit of courage. And now, finally, uh, kind of a tough question, right? Is it possible that your past experience might make it tougher and not easier to change, to to change direction? It's, uh, it's a challenging question because if you think about who you are as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as a chief executive, your experience is the core of, what, of who and what you are. In fact, if I were to ask you, you know, well, who are you? One answer could be, well, here's my resume. It tells, me, it tells you who you are, who I am. And, and who you are and what's in the resume is, you know, I did this, I accomplished that, I did this, I worked there. It's your experience. And so obviously your experience is absolutely critical. And many of us rely on our intuition based on experience. All good things until sometimes the world changes to such a degree that that intuition and that kind of past experience can actually make it tougher and not easier to, uh, to change direction. And I want to, um, I want to illustrate this point in a uh, kind of an unusual example. It's a, it's a story you all, you all actually know, uh, but I want to kind of spin it in a way that really drives home this point and kind of leads to a couple other, couple other insights as well. Um, uh, of course, you know Captain Sullenberger and why he's uh, famous, uh, you know, the, uh, the aircraft on the, Hudson, on the Hudson River. Sometimes people say, uh, you know, well, why, I ask, why is he famous? W what made him so successful? And they say, well, he landed his plane in, in, in the water in the Hudson River. And I have to correct them because I could land the plane in the water also. The point is that they all survived, right? It's a little bit different scenario. Uh, the truth is I don't think I could get the plane in the water. It's not, even that's not that easy. Uh, so let me tell you the story, okay? Let me kind of fill you in on the, on the story that kind of makes the point. Uh, so this is a flight from uh, LaGuardia to, um, I, I think, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and the aircraft is just taking off from LaGuardia, just beginning to gain altitude. And uh, if you recall, what happened is a, a, a flock of geese got ingested into both engines and incapacitated both engines. And obviously, Captain Sullenberger, you know, Sully as he was known, he's got a real problem. He's got to figure out something. And by the way, did you ever notice in all of these accounts on TV or on, 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 in the newspaper about these flock of geese that got ingested into both engines, they always refer to these geese as Canadian geese. <laughs> Anyone ever notice that? I happen to be Canadian, I take that personally. Uh, I also don't see why that makes any difference whatsoever. <laughs> They're geese, come on. All right. <laughs> Captain Sullenberger's got to make a decision, right? What's his decision? His decision is to turn around the aircraft and get back to LaGuardia Airport. That's his decision. That's the first decision that he makes. Let's talk about uh, decision-making process. What was it like? Well, did he have a long debate with his co-pilot? Probably not, right? Uh, did he form a committee to kind of analyze the situation? <laughs> Commission a white paper, uh, call the CEO, hey boss, what should I do? Uh, ask the passengers in the back what they thought. No, 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 and no. He knew exactly what he needed to do. He was 100% sure what he needed to do because of experience, because of intuition, because of training, and, 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 and he decided that instantly. But what is so fascinating about the story is, as you know, it didn't end up that he got back to LaGuardia, right? Uh, th there, were, there were a couple other things that happened along the way. And one of them is, uh, is here, if you look in this photo, the, the aircraft is circled. It's now, you know, Manhattan's in the uh, foreground of that photo. Uh, New Jersey's in the background, and um, the aircraft now is flying uh, south over the, over the Hudson River. And Captain Sullenberger, uh, Sullenberger, he makes another decision. He decides that the, that the LaGuardia decision is a bad decision, uh, and he decides he wants to land at Teterboro Airport, which is, as you may know, a, a, a smaller airport on the New Jersey side of the water uh, that's a lot closer. The reason why LaGuardia was a bad decision is there's no way he'd be able to retain the loft of the aircraft for that length of time. So he realized, uh, you know, we got to land a lot, a lot closer. So his second decision is land in Teterboro. Decision-making process, 
same as before. No long discussions, debates, analyses. He knows, and he knows instantly exactly what he needs to do. But recall again that this is someone who a minute or two earlier was completely sure that the right answer was something different. So then we have this kind of interesting discussion or transcript between air traffic control and Captain, Captain Sullenberger. And air traffic control tells him, okay, you're, you're clear to land at, at runway one at, uh, at Teterboro. And Captain Sullenberger says, we can't do it. And air traffic control then asks, and it's kind of an interesting question if you think about it. Well, okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? <laughs> oh man, I could just see Sullenberger saying, I will not accept runway one. <laughs> I'll take four, I'll take 11, and 15 in a pinch, but one is out of the question. And he says, we're gonna be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again. And you have this kind of incredible landing, right? Famous photo of the aircraft on the Hudson. And so his third decision is landing the aircraft in the Hudson. And again, I won't go through who he didn't, who he didn't talk to, uh, the committees he didn't form. He knew and he knew instantly exactly what he, uh, what he needs, uh, exactly what he needs to do. And uh, so let's, um, let's draw out the lesson from this, and, and it's really all about experience. And by, by the way, this is also an interesting photo because it indicates the difference between economy and first class. <laughs> Just saying. All right, so is experience a good thing? Is experience a good thing? Well, you know, let's look at Sully. He was an experienced pilot, one of the most experienced pilots in the entire US Airways fleet. If there was something that was going on, uh, if there was some training, he'd be one of the people involved. He was also an experienced accident investigator. And so if he had a, if there was an issue or an incident, he'd be one of the guys they'd send to go and kind of figure out what happened. And to top it all off, he was a certified glider pilot. So I don't know about you, but if I was stuck in this plane, he's the guy I'd like to have flying. <laughs> the point is this, virtually Perfect experience for the challenge that he faced. I mean, can you imagine any better experience than this for what he had to deal with? And, and, and what I want you to think about is the following. How often is it the case that your experience is so perfectly coupled, if you will, to the challenge that you're facing? How often is it the case that the things that have gotten you to where you are today are 100% exactly the right things that you need, to, you need to draw on to solve the next problem, the new problem, the new, new thing? And when that's not the case, how often do you still rely on your own experience and your own playbook? And these are, of course, rhetorical questions. We all know the answer. We all do that. It's human, it's human nature. But I think you can see what the, what the, what the risk is and what the, uh, what the danger is. Um, uh, when we're confronted with new situations that are really, really different, it is possible that our experience can hurt you. It's possible it could hurt us rather than help us. And that goes completely against the grain of how most people think about experience, think about what we've done. And it's a hard lesson to swallow because you know your experience got you to where, where you are. And here I am telling you, you know what? There could be a circumstance when the situation is so different, when you continue to go back to the same game plan, you could end up in a lot of, in a lot of trouble. And, 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 uh, and it has very broad applicability, this, uh, this point. Um, it turns out, um, uh, maybe uh, some of you read Maureen Dowd, great columnist in the New York Times. She had a column last week um, referring to President uh, Obama as Sir uh, uh, Lecture a Lot, uh, which I thought was uh, interesting. Um, and uh, she, made a, she made a point, uh, she quoted Mark Twain uh, about a cat, and she, and she said something to the effect that, you know, if a cat sits on a hot stove, they're never going to do that again. But they're also not going to sit on a cold stove. So you learn the right lesson, but maybe you also learn something that, 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 uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't help you. This is true for mergers and acquisitions. It's true for hiring talent. I mean, think about the M&A example, for example, for, uh, as one instance. Um, when you make an acquisition, you bought another company. Um, if you're smart, you're gonna figure, especially if you haven't done this a lot, you're gonna try to repeat the things that worked before, because you learned, right? And the mistakes that you made last time, well, you don't wanna repeat the same mistakes, so why would you do the same thing again? And it turns out that that formula of doing what worked before and, what, and avoiding what didn't work last time might be exactly the opposite formula you need if the new acquisition, the new situation is so dramatically different. I mean, ironically, it could be that doing what you did before is not gonna work and actually some of what maybe 
uh, didn't work so well, might, might actually fit this new, this new situation. It's possible. It's true for hiring talent, the way in which you think about hiring talent. You figure you know how to hire talent. We have some professionals in this room that know how to do this better than I. Uh, uh, and and you, you, did a, you did a good job. And then you follow exactly the same format in terms of your own interviewing and, or whatever. And you realize, well, maybe there's more nuance. There's a lot of subtlety. There's a lot of nuance. It's true for any repeatable, complex um, uh, challenge. So new product introductions, I think, could fall into this category, going into new, into new countries. Um, um, uh, almost any complex, challenging managerial activity, leadership activity that you end up doing over time more, more than once uh, could fall into this trap. And it's a very natural thing to think about because we have, all of us, have a natural tendency to overgeneralize from small sample sizes. So if you've done something once and you work well, we, we, we tend to believe that we can do the same thing again another time. And uh, dare I say that that could have been part of the uh, downfall of, of Ron Johnson. Uh, was that experience at Apple the right experience to lead a company like J.C. Penney? And you know, there are, again, people, including Mr. Altman in the room, knows a lot more about this than, than I do. But uh, is, is, is the brand, the image, the reputation, the price point, um, the nature of the products, are they so similar across these very different companies that you can apply a model that work really well with Apple stores to a different scenario. And, uh, and I think that that was, uh, that was one of the things that got, uh, got Ron Johnson into, uh, into trouble. What's the lesson out of all this? Uh, well, well, here you go. There's no replacement for what I like to call intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty simply means that you, um, you face up to the world that's around you the way it really is, not the way you wish it was. It's kind of like a mental health thing if you start to think about it a little bit, right? We're all better off kind of facing up to what's around and dealing with it. You, have to, you, you deal with whatever the challenges are. The world changes. We need to change with it. And I could say, you know, we could say that Captain Sullenberger was an extreme case of intellectual honesty because as that data changed, he certainly changed in, in his kind of life and death uh, scenario. We don't live and work in that, uh, in that scenario, but the same concept, the same idea holds, this idea of, of, of the importance of... Uh, uh, the importance of intellectual, uh, of intellectual honesty, um, uh, this sense that, you, that, that, that w the way the world really, really is, we need to adapt to it, we need to adjust. Uh, and it points out to me uh, some of the most important leadership uh, attributes or capabilities, if you will, that I've seen in studying and working with, with CEOs in many, many different industries. And, uh, and, and actually, even in this short presentation, a bunch of them have come out. Uh, I would say uh, near the top of the list, adaptability and open-mindedness, uh, intellectual honesty to be, to be sure, um, uh, personal responsibility and accountability, and, uh, and I'd also say self-awareness. Self-awareness is a touchy-feely type of topic, right? It means knowing who you are and how you make decisions and how you behave and how people interact with you. But I have seen in my, uh, in my many years working with senior executives, again, in a lot of different countries and a lot of different um, companies, uh, industries, uh, you, can, you can tell when people have this sense about themselves of self-awareness. So they know, their, they know some of the tendencies they might have that could lead them astray. It's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous skill. So in, uh, in, in, in wrapping up, you know, why, don't, why don't people learn? Uh, it's really all, it's really, uh, all, all on us. Uh, we might think we're different. We might think that, uh, um, uh, that we can't learn anything from, from a new situation. Uh, we believe sometimes that we're unable to, when in fact it's really us, we're unwilling to, and a lack of intellectual honesty. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to take some uh, questions if there, if there are any. There's a question over here. You used Ron Johnson as an example of, well, maybe he didn't have the right experience, but you also then brought up examples of companies like Uber and Netflix and Airbnb, all of which took many years to disrupt their industry. Uber took four or five years has been working on it. So don't you think that someone who's trying to innovate within a company should be given slightly more time to see if whatever their disruption is, is able to germinate and take effect? You know, is there yeah, a timing so, issue? Uh, so certainly transformation, changing any organization, 
especially if you're thinking about a new business model, I mean, it's going to take it's going to take some time. And I can't speak to kind of the, the amount of time that Ron Johnson had, the decisions of the board made. I wasn't, you know, obviously part of that. Uh, but I think the the downfall, the the uh, I, I would say the speed of the transformation, if you want to call it that, the 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 the, the extent of the the radical nature of the changes. Uh, Someone I, um, someone in in the industry uh, who I, who is pretty close to the situation told me, put it this way: Ron Johnson, his first act was to fire his customers. That that's that's radical. That's pretty that's pretty extreme uh, uh, by completely changing the the model. So I'm sympathetic to exactly what you say. I don't know about that specific situation about the uh, the, the the timing, but you know there's a process to go through. Uh, and uh, and those of you that have that have taken on and been involved with turnaround situations, uh, there's a lot of things that you need to uh, uh, that that you need to do, uh, and it's very d difficult to kind of blow up everything and then start from start from scratch. That would be kind of my my take on that. Yes, right here. Uh, in this hunt for intellectual um, honesty. How do you know when you're kind of starting to hit the railing, and how do you catch it before you go off the cliff? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So how do you how do you really know when you're getting close to the place where it gets dangerous? Well, uh, so I mentioned self-awareness. Uh, that's a powerful thing. Uh, if you're self-aware, you are always asking yourself, what could I do better? What am I doing wrong? And I think we heard this uh, actually was, uh, again, uh, Sophia from Nasty Gal said, you know, the people that she's hiring, she wants people that are unafraid to push back. What do you need them for? She said something like this earlier today. What do you need those people for if they're not willing to challenge and, 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 and push back? I absolutely saw that in company after company. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the team of rivals that became you know, pretty well known, um, uh, and, uh, and this whole idea of encouraging and doing everything you can to, first of all, hire the best talent, absolutely hire the best talent, but then unleash them to give you, to give them an opportunity to have an impact on what's going on with respect specifically to pushing back, challenging, asking, asking, uh, asking questions. So some of it is on yourself in terms of self-awareness. Some of it is in terms of how you build a team. And, and, and a really good team is a team where people are unafraid to kind of raise their hand and say, you know, there's a real, there's a real problem here. And it, it, again, it takes, takes a lot of courage uh, for a CEO, for a leader to allow that to happen because you're going to be challenged. And the, I, I have found it's really the most courageous, not the least, but the most courageous CEOs that are uh, unafraid to build the type of team around them where people are challenging and, and pushing back. So it's a really big, uh, uh, it's a really big uh, point. And, and I think it's one that most people, most leaders, you have, you have within your control, as certainly as a chief executive, in, develop, in hiring the right people, but developing the culture that you want to ensure that as best you can, you have that real, that, 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 that real tension, that real debate in the, uh, in the management team. One question over here, please. Um, thanks, great talk. Uh, you mentioned particular how individuals or the executives um, should continue to learn. What can one do to have uh, an organization that learns? So what could you do to have an organization that learns? A lot of things. Not, number one, model the, model the behavior you want at the top, which starts with the CEO and other senior executives uh, that demonstrate that they are actually open in the way that I just described, that they do, that they do want to learn. Uh, uh, number two, create an infrastructure that allows it to happen. I'm really struck by this. You know, we, we talked a lot about social media and all kinds of forms of communication between you and your customers. What about internally, especially as, you're, as your companies, have, some of them are very big. Um, to what extent do, do you have processes in place that enable real discussion and sharing of ideas? And, and it's actually an interesting thing. Al Alan Alda, the famous uh, actor you know, from MASH, his, uh, his passion these days is, uh, is helping scientists communicate their ideas more effectively. And he's spending a lot of time on, on that. And he actually gave a, gave a lecture at, at uh, Dartmouth, where, I'm, where I am at the, at the college. Um, and, uh, uh, and, he, and he said, um, the reason why the Neanderthals died off is because of, he didn't say social media, social networking and communication. And what he said, he had a great line. He said, uh, for the Neanderthals, what happened in cave number 12 stayed in cave number 12. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great line, and I'm borrowing it with, uh, with full credit to Mr. Alda. Uh, and what it meant really is um, 
people come up with ideas, ways of, of communicating, coming up with, with ways of solving problems. What if, you're, if you just keep that within one person or one small team, especially as you've, you have some of these more far-flung companies where you're in a lot of different countries or, or locations, or what about you know, anyone with more than one store, you have the same thing. What's being discovered in a store and to what extent are you putting into one location, one retail location, and to what extent are you putting that into play to share? Uh, and, uh, and I think internal social media, if you will, and some companies are better than, better than others on that, uh, I think is a really big uh, place. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there. I mean, if you've if you got great people and you have a far-flung company, you have any organization with multiple retail units, which is just about everyone, right? Uh, why wouldn't you want to learn from those people? So create something to do that. Make it a priority uh, because it doesn't happen automatically. Um, so those are a couple of thoughts um, um, along the lines of that question. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you. Thank you.